What I want to do here is I want to launch right into another explanation to try to persuade and reveal, illuminate people as to the problems that I see with the preaching of repentance and faith proven by deeds today in, in and out of the system. And we'll touch, of course, on both sides like we always do. I was thinking of these things over the past few days as we've taken some time to rest. The sum of all truth. The summary of all truth. And then the opposite of all truth in what all this false theology, this Arminianism or Calvinism or whatever ism it is. And we get labeled a lot of times with different things, but we're not on anybody's particular ism. It doesn't make any difference. They're all in error to some degree, some worse than others. But the bottom line, they're all limiting man's ability to obey God. So that said, it seemed to me that the sum of all truth in the scriptures is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, and on that hangs all the law and the prophets, like Matthew 22 said, like Christ told them. That was the greatest commandment. That's the way to inherit eternal life. But was that a new truth with Christ? No, it over, appears over a hundred times in the scriptures, all the way back to Moses in Deuteronomy, where he says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, and he goes on to say and tells them what, what uh, you must do to command these things. You teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. See, that's what the people of God are supposed to be doing if they really loved God and followed him instead of inventing a bunch of theologies why they don't. You see, bind them as a sign on your on your hand and be a frontal between your eyes. You shall write them on your doorposts, in your house, and your gates. In other words, you place them into your mind. If you want to inherit eternal life, then you instill these things, teach them diligently from generation to generation, bond them into the hearts and minds of the people, then keep and guard them carefully, earnestly contend for these things, publicize them throughout the world as the way, the truth, and the life. Not this moral depravity, he did it for you nonsense, which they've been doing. So the opposite of all that, to do what's right, live pure and clean before God, the opposite of all that is you can't do it. He did it for you, and if you try to do it yourself, you'll save, you're trying to save yourself and establish your own righteousness. It's all summarized. If you wanted to say one thing that summarizes all the theology that's out there, whether it's Calvinism or Armenianism or Wesleyanism or Augustinianism or Lutheranism, it doesn't make any difference. It's all summarized and you can sin and not die. And I have a long history of studying all that stuff, reading tons and tons of material, and it was all based on how can people commit the sins listed in Scripture that says will disqualify them from the kingdom if they do them and still inherit the kingdom. And that prompted us to always write that question to the preachers that we began way back, years ago, does a person have to stop sinning to receive Christ? Then we began to really see what these guys believe. Not only do they don't have to stop sinning, they don't have to stop sinning after they receive Christ. Because nothing will keep them out of the kingdom except unbelief in their minds. So every theological assumption that's been invented by man since the 4th century is invented on this premise. That you can sin and not die because you're not able to obey God. Based on the following depravities or theologies and fallacies. Moral depravity, people born in sin, they're inbred with the sin nature, they have a, some corruption within their will that they can't obey God, they're unwilling, all this other stuff, all some form of it. And then the finished work of Jesus Christ, he did it all for you, he died and obeyed for your place, and you got the satisfaction and the substitution and the atonement and all the alternatives to obedience, all those things, all those things invented theologies. Some people got the tulip. You know, the faith alone nonsense, the trust, uh, receive trust and rest, that he has to grant you repentance if you're among the elect, unconditional election, uh, moral depravity, irresistible grace, limited atonement, all that nonsense that they came up with, that they think they found somewhere in the scriptures. Of course, they think they found it, but it was never 
never even dreamed of among the early saints who gave their lives for Christ. So all these things come down to you can't you can sin and not die because you're morally depraved, you got a corrupt nature. The finished work of Jesus Christ provide, has a provision that takes care of all that for you. There's a moral transfer of his virtue to you that took place. He's your righteousness, not you doing what's right, but he's your righteousness. If you try to do what's right, that's establishing your own righteousness, and you're saving yourself, and we'll, we'll talk more about that. And, of course, the substitution, the satisfaction, uh, whether it's penal substitution or moral government, whatever it is, it's all nobody's perfect, nobody's righteous, all born sinners, you're the wretched man, the chief of sinners, inability, lack of ability, hindered free will. You're saved in sin, you never stop sinning, you sin daily in thought, word, and deed. If you say you have no sin, you're a liar and the truth is not in you. Everything you do is sin, and temptation is sin, it's not of works, nothing you do matters, and it's judge not, least you be judged. I, I don't know if I touched on all of them or not. Uh, it's, it, it's piled high and deep, folks kind of like Ph.D., and that's exactly what these guys come out of these seminaries with, piled high and deep, folks, and that's what they disseminate to you 24-7 from the church pulpits, in the books, in the videos, in everything that's online, and then the street preachers that come out of the system go out there and tell people to stop sinning, but they're still confused about, the, well, they got a corrupt nature. They, they're not willing. They, can't, they have inability. They lack ability. They have a free will, but they can't exercise that free will. Why? Where in the scriptures is that dealt with? See, the whole crux of their teaching, like I said, based on this, you can sin and not die. Thou shalt surely not die, like in Genesis chapter 3. The whole crux of it could be summarized in turning the verses around in 1 John 3. He who sins is of God. He who does not sin is self-righteous. Instead of he who sins... He who does what is right is righteous. He who sins is of the devil. No, to them it's he who sins is of God. Because if they don't admit that they're sinful and wretched and all that, then there's no truth in them. That's what they're taught. And he who does not sin, who walks in purity and righteousness before God, he's self-righteous. He's trying to establish his own righteousness. So anyone who does what is right by his own free will choice is robbing God of his sovereignty and trying to self-justify and pump himself up with pride and stand before God and see what I did. It is frustrating. But nobody seems to get this. Very few people seem to get the ability of man. God's doing his part, folks. He's always doing his part to convict the world, not willing any should perish, stretching forth his hand. He's always there to bring someone through repentance but don't tell me they've got to be justified first in their sins before they can come clean with God. No, there's a process of coming clean with God. And that's that process of repentance, the godly sorrow that worketh repentance unto salvation. That's what. See, what, dil what, dil what dil disqualifies a person from the kingdom in their, in their mind? In the system, only what? Unbelief. That's the only thing. He that believeth not is condemned. John 3.36, of course, that means he who does, obeyeth not. In the other scriptures, that word, if you look it up, oh, believe is obey in the same thing in scripture. Just like Peter, Peter used it in the sense in 1 Peter 4.17, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will the end of those be who obey not the gospel of Christ? The same thing Christ said in John 3.36. Same thing. You, he that obeys not the gospel will not see life. So that kind of blows the whole thing away. But yet, because of their theology, they turn obedience into trust on the premise of inability that there was a provision had to be made in the finished work of Christ. So man then can sin and not die. He can commit the sins that are listed in the scriptures clearly to disqualify you, drunkenness and pornography and, and uh, perversions of sexuality and adultery and all that other stuff, and not die, and he just blames God then because he's, God's asking him to do something he's not capable of. So he has to trust in the preachers then offering him this free gift, this, this free grace. 
That's how they dispense this uh, mark of the beast, so to speak, in Revelation 13, where it talks about there. They're, what they're doing is they're dispensing this as a gift to the people that they can be saved in their sins, promising them liberty while they remain slaves to their corruption. That's how you receive that, that uh, mark of your flesh. You don't crucify your flesh. It's uncrucified passions and desires of the flesh. See, the sins that are listed in 1 Corinthians 